two top guns are locked in combat over a steamy tropical island. You had to get in really close back in those days, like a knife fight. So you had to have the target fill the windscreen and then press the trigger. In a desperate dogfight, each pilot tries to lock the other into his gun sights. But then, when they have the perfect shot, they don't go in for the kill. An act of chivalry, a loss of nerve, or a mechanical malfunction. The wreckage reveals the truth behind the dogfight over Guadalcanal. In the skies above Guadalcanal, two fighter pilots duel in a legendary dogfight of the Second World War. It was one of the epic air battles of all time, eyeball to eyeball, gun to gun, aircraft to aircraft. This is the high noon of the Pacific War, a showdown between each side's frontline fighter. In a desperate dogfight, each pilot tries to lock the other into his gun sights. But then, when they have the perfect shot, they don't go in for the kill. An act of chivalry, a loss of nerve, or a mechanical malfunction. By the end of the battle, each pilot and his plane will be riddled with bullets. And yet they survive. This remarkable story will lead investigators deep into the jungle of Guadalcanal, where they make an amazing discovery and finally solve the mystery of the dogfight over Guadalcanal. During 1942, two rival fighter planes fight for supremacy of the skies in the war over the Pacific. The Japanese Imperial Navy Zero and the US Navy's Wildcat. When the planes meet over the Pacific island of Guadalcanal on August 7th, it becomes an extraordinary test of man and machine. On that day, two outstanding pilots are in the air, Saburu Sakai and Pug Sutherland. Each keeps a detailed journal of the precise anatomy of that first encounter. It is one of the best documented dogfights of the Pacific War. I could hear the steady stream of bullets zinging in behind me. The after part of my fuselage was like a sieve. Never had I seen an enemy plane move so quickly or so gracefully before. Every second his guns were moving closer to the belly of my fighter. Each pilot admires his opponent's tenacity, courage and flying skills. Both men are at the top of their game. Both realize that they have to push their planes to the absolute limit. To the end, the outcome remains uncertain. Saburo Sakai is 25 and already a proven ace with over 50 kills to his name. His ancestors are samurai. The pilot training scheme which Sakai joins in 1937 imbues him with that same feudalistic warrior philosophy. The school produces only a handful of pilots, but they are instilled with the belief that they will overcome greater enemy numbers because of their rigorous training. Training in the Imperial Armed Forces was extremely disciplined, extremely difficult, it was downright brutal. Physical punishment was a fact of life in all of Japan's armed forces. Being punched in the face, being hit in the buttocks with baseball bats, this was all par for the course. Sumo wrestling, for example, was meant to instill an aggressive spirit in them. You were in the ring with your opponent, and if you lost, you had to stay there until you prevailed over somebody. In Sakai's year, only 25 of the class of 70 non-commissioned officers survived the course. He receives the silver watch offered each year by Emperor Hirohito for the outstanding student pilot. Puck Sutherland comes from a very different background. He is trained at the US Naval Academy as an officer and gentleman. 
He has always wanted to fly from aircraft carriers. A fellow Naval Academy cadet and friend who remembers him well is David Richardson. Pug was an excellent pilot. Uh, Pug, of course, means pugnacious. And uh, he uh, had been a boxer at the Naval Academy, very aggressive type, very competent, very cheerful individual, uh, a lot of fun to be with. Like Sakai, Pug is determined to succeed. His skill at avoiding punches easily translates to ducking and diving in the air, and he becomes one of the best shots in his squadron. But unlike Sakai, he has no combat experience, and he is desperate to engage an enemy. He won't have long to wait. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. On that day, Saburo Sakai is escorting a squadron of Japanese bombers on another mission to destroy US military bases in the Philippines. When American fighters launch a counterattack, Sakai shoots down and claims his first American kill. While Sakai is shooting down Americans in the Pacific, Pug Sutherland is 5,000 miles away on an aircraft carrier patrolling the Atlantic. But with the declaration of war, it is not long before the United States is scrambling to deploy troops in the Pacific to counteract the Japanese onslaught. In June 1942, the Japanese start constructing a landing strip on the island of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. Japan will soon pose a threat to the Allied shipping lanes between the United States and Australia. So the American command decides to launch their first major counterattack. When reports of an almost completed airstrip on Guadalcanal reaches Admiral Nimitz, he orders a three-carrier task force to invade the island. The amphibious landing by 19,000 Marines is supported by as powerful an invasion fleet as the United States has ever assembled. On July 7th, the carrier Saratoga departs Pearl Harbor with Pug and his squadron aboard. They are equipped with the Grumman Wildcat, the US Navy's frontline fighter. As they steam across the Pacific Ocean, the officers assemble for a pre-battle squadron photo, an event that gives them pause for thought. How many will be there for the next portrait? On July 20th, the squadron loses three Wildcats and damages two more while attempting to land after a gunnery exercise. The next day, Pug and his fellow pilots are briefed on their role for the invasion. Stories of cannibalism on the Solomon Islands are rife. They are told not to approach the natives if they have to bail out. On August 7, 1942, eight months to the day since the attack on Pearl Harbor, the invasion begins. Shortly after dawn, US battleships start shelling the islands of Guadalcanal and neighboring Tulagi. But the US invasion takes the isolated Japanese garrison by surprise. They are completely overwhelmed. They radio for help, but the nearest Japanese base is 565 miles away, in Rabaul. The base commander, Rear Admiral Yamada, is faced with a daunting problem. Guadalcanal is far away, at the absolute limit of the range of his fighters. Nevertheless, he orders Sakai and 17 of his fellow pilots to get ready to fly there. We checked the distance from Rabaul to Guadalcanal. It meant a round trip of more than 1,100 miles without allowance for combat or storms which would consume fuel in prodigious quantities. As Sakai recorded in his journal, it was to be the longest sortie he had ever been asked to fly. It looks like a suicide mission. But the fabled Zero's lightweight design makes it amazingly fuel efficient. The US Navy had nothing like it.
the Wildcat was at a serious disadvantage to the Zero. Without drop tanks that would fit under the wings, the Wildcat had a typical combat radius of about 200 nautical miles. Now that was fairly uh, representative of most fighters that were flying at the time. But we knew almost nothing about the Zero. It could fly one way, 500 to 550 nautical miles, engage in a dogfight, and return to base all on one tank of gas. And consequently, when Zeros were showing up so far from uh, land bases, the Americans drew the logical conclusion that the Japanese had more carriers than we thought they did. In creating a fighter that operates in the vast Pacific theater, the designers of the Zero have had to make some compromises on safety. To find out what price Japanese pilots had to pay for the Zero's long range, former fighter pilot Ralph Wetterhahn meets Saburo Sakai's biographer, Henry Sakaida. You notice here, it's like, you know, a lot of GIs, when they came upon crashed Japanese Zeros, they take their jungle knives and they would cut a panel out to bring home. You know, I mean, these things were just like tin cans, sides of tin cans. I also understand that to save weight for this long-range mission, they wound up stripping the aircraft down of every non-essential item, including the radios, which for a fighter pilot, a radio is pretty darn important to give warnings and to coordinate attacks. Uh, the Japanese Zero uh, radio was very, very uh, inferior, and so what they would do is they would just yank that out of the airplane, and they would try to just get rid of any weight they figure was non-essential. Ralph's keen to learn about the Japanese attitude towards protecting their pilots from Imperial Navy historian Sam Tagaya. It doesn't appear that the Japanese gave a lot of priority to uh, armor plating and, and cockpit protection. You can see it's just thin metal on, on the oh, sides yeah. here. The Zero that Sakai flew, the Model 2-1, uh, didn't have any uh, armor plating or self-sealing fuel tanks. The Japanese combat personnel especially were imbued with this philosophy of always being prepared to sacrifice one's life. Uh, tended to make them think that protective features on aircraft were not uh, a very high priority. I think the Japanese neglected that, just like they neglected having a good radio. But eventually you find out that you're not going to sustain yourself in an attrition war, which this turned out to be, because right. you're going to lose your experienced pilots. The naval air base at Rabaul is home to a group of Japan's most seasoned pilots. When news of the invasion of Guadalcanal reaches Rabaul, the commanding officer immediately orders 27 bombers to counterattack. Although their mission will be to sink transport ships, they do not pause to switch bombs for more lethal torpedoes. Mitsubishi Zero fighters will protect the bomber formation. Just before takeoff, Sakai warns his two wingmen about the American pilots they're about to face for the first time. He orders them to stay in formation. Above all, never break away from me. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on around us, stick as close to my plan as you can. Remember that, don't break away. This is Sakai's last chance to speak to them directly. Once en route, hand signals will be the only way to communicate. By 10 o'clock, a force of 17 fighters and 27 bombers is on its way. Like the Zero fighter, the bombers have no fire protection for their fuel tanks. Their crews call them flying cigars because of their tendency to quickly catch a light when hit. As the aerial armada reaches cruising altitude, the amphibious assault by US Marines on Guadalcanal has already begun in earnest. Below decks on the Saratoga, Pug's team receives news that a large Japanese force is approaching. Fellow pilot David Richardson remembers their reaction. Were we afraid? Did we have a sense of fear? No, that, that isn't a part. Uh, uh, you fly your airplane. You focus on what you're doing at the time. Uh, you really don't think about life and death. What you think about is how do you fight your plane? Pug has only eight Wildcats under his command to intercept the 27 Japanese bombers. It takes them 45 minutes to get on station over the transport ships, still disgorging Marines and their equipment. 
At the same time as Pug's flight arrives, the Japanese formation also gets their first glimpse of the amphibious landing. Even at a distance, Sakai is amazed at the size of the operation. There must have been 70 transports approaching the beaches, and there were other ships too distant and numerous to count. After flying for around four and a half hours, the Zeros drop their empty external fuel tanks. Sakai scans the sky for American fighters. Pug also searches through the clouds, looking for Japanese bombers. His task is to shoot them down, if possible without engaging the Zero fighters escorting them. At 1300 hours, Pug finally catches his first glimpse of the Japanese formation. Horizontal bombers, three divisions, nine planes each, over Savo, headed for transports. Put gun switches and sight lamps on. Let's go get them, boys. Pug shoots down the lead bomber and scores the first American success of the air battle. Pug was an excellent shot. He was among the very best in our squadron, perhaps in the top four or five. Anything that found itself in front of a Wildcat with its 650 caliber machine gun was in very deep trouble. The recoil is powerful. Physically, it slows you down. It's as if you were flying into a brick wall. Despite taking some hits, Pug destroys the bomber. But he is now a marked man. The Zeros are on to him, and he needs every trick in the book to fend them off. Although the Wildcat would win no beauty contests and lacks the rate of climb and acceleration of the sleek Zero, it can dive faster. Tactics were soon devised to exploit this advantage. The United States naval aviators used boom and zoom tactics. They would get the Wildcat as high above the Zero or a Japanese formation as possible, shove everything forward, full throttle, make a high-speed dive, shoot, pull out, use the momentum from that dive to zoom climb to the perch again. And if they were in a position to re-attack, that's what they would do. Because the bombers were so close to their target, Pug had no time to climb and attack them from above. Sakai watches in dismay as every single bomb crashes harmlessly into the ocean. It was obviously stupid to try and hit moving ships from four miles up. I could not understand the failure to use torpedoes which had proved so effective in the past. After the failure of their mission, the Japanese bombers turn around for the long journey home. Disappointed that they have not hit a single ship, Sakai is desperate to shoot down an enemy aircraft. As he searches for the chubby Grumman-built Wildcats, he spots an extraordinary dogfight several hundred feet below him. It is Pug Sutherland, neatly evading several Zeros. Sakai is amazed at the skill of the Wildcats pilot. The Zeros should have been able to take the long Grumman without any trouble. But every time a Zero caught the Wildcat before its guns, the enemy plane flipped away and came out again on the tail of another Zero. I had never seen such flying before. Two of his assailants are Sakai's wingmen. Seeing how the Wildcat is exploiting their inexperience, Sakai signals that he wants to join the fray. He dives in and fires a burst from long range. Pug immediately retaliates by climbing towards the belly of Sakai Zero. The historic duel has begun. Sakai tries to throw Pug off, but he matches the Zero turn for turn. We held to the spiral. Tremendous G pressures pushing us down in our seats. A great film seemed to be clouding my eyes. As the jungle of Guadalcanal rushes towards his fighter, Pug pulls out of the spiral and climbs into a loop. This is a mistake. A Zero easily outturns a Wildcat in such a maneuver. I went right after him and came out on his tail. I pumped 200 rounds into the Grumman's cockpit, watching the bullets chewing up the thin metal skin and shattering the glass. 
I couldn't believe what I saw. The wildcat continued flying almost as if nothing had happened. A zero that had taken that many bullets would have been a ball of fire by now. The Wildcat's manufacturer, Grumman, designed a cockpit that can handle a lot of punishment. Uh, Sutherland was pretty well protected from any stern aspect because this plate goes from almost the top of the canopy clear to the bottom of the, uh, the cockpit floor. I was deeply grateful to the manufacturers of the armor plate, for I could hear the steady stream of bullets zinging into it behind me. That's what Pug Sutherland was hearing, sort of the the rattle on the, uh, the roof of these small caliber rifle bullets. Such small bullets have little impact on the heavily armored Wildcat. The uh, forward part of the windscreen has a three inch uh, thick segment of laminated glass. It's called armored glass, and that will stop a uh, 7.7 .7 fired from almost any distance. Well, because of the durability of his airplane, because of the armor plate around his cockpit, and because of the self-sealing gas tanks that prevented catastrophic fires in flight, Sutherland was able to survive against three or four Zeros. But the Zero has a much more lethal weapon, a cannon mounted on each wing. Sakai and some of the more proficient Zero pilots like to use the 7.7s as ranging, and once they were hitting with those, then, they haul out this Hummer, which is a 20 millimeter shell. In order to fill his gun sight for a cannon burst, Sakai accelerates closer to the Wildcat. But he is in for a surprise. Pug is about to put the brakes on. I slammed the throttle forward just as the enemy fighter lost speed. In the moment, I was 10 yards ahead of the Wildcat, trying to slow down. Pug has laid his trap well. The Zero is now in his gun sights. Sakai braces himself for the inevitable end. I hunched my shoulders and prepared for the onslaught of his guns. Yet nothing happens. No bullets came. The Wildcat's guns remained silent. The entire situation was unbelievable. Mysteriously, in that brief, vital moment, Pug Sutherland does not go in for the kill. Was his plane damaged? Were his guns jammed? Or does Pug just fail to pull the trigger for some reason? Sakai could not believe his luck. He immediately takes evasive action to avoid the Wildcat's line of fire. He drew up alongside Pug's plane. Looking across at the American pilot, he sees he is wounded. Blood stained his right shoulder. I saw the dark patch moving downwards over his chest. Now it is Sakai's turn to hold fire. For a moment, Sakai hesitates to deliver the coup de grace. I honestly didn't know whether or not I should try and finish him off. Such thoughts were stupid, of course. Wounded or not, he was the enemy. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about this particular uh, dogfight is that Sakai shows a little mercy. Well, the Japanese Zero pilots, uh, they're uh, trained very harshly, and they're um, attitude was kill or be killed. Sakai, he knew very well that the American pilots were very tough and that if he had allowed them to uh, escape that they could be up the very next day to kill his comrades. So I don't believe that he would have shown any mercy at all. Not everyone who met Sakai came away with the same impression. He was a genuine gentleman, but he saw a fellow aviator who was obviously wounded and at that moment, Saburo Sakai decided that humanity outweighed duty, and he decided to let Sutherland live. Sakai will claim in his memoirs that he deliberately avoided aiming his guns at the pilot. But when Pug jerks the Wildcat into a climb, Sakai knows the plane must be destroyed. That was it. I aimed carefully at the engine. A Zero put a burst just under the left wing route. I dove over the right side. As Pug bails out, his gun is ripped from its holster. He manages to open his parachute less than 400 feet above the jungle canopy. As he falls to earth, he sees his plane explode.
64 years later, questions still remain about the events leading up to Sakai's final gun burst. Did he really spare Pug's life on purpose? And why hadn't Pug fired when he had the chance? To search for answers, Ralph Wetterhahn is heading to Guadalcanal to examine the recently found wreckage of Pug's plane. Pieces of the Wildcat are scattered deep in the jungle, but Ralph believes that his experience as an Air Force crash investigator may help him discover clues about what really happened that fateful day. I think the important thing for me in working my way through the, the story is to get inside the minds of both men uh, by confirming certain aspects of the story, of which there are many different versions, we can find out how they really thought and how they really acted and what really transpired in those moments over Guadalcanal and on the land. Ralph has heard reports that a local man, Edlon G, has found wreckage that could be Pug's plane. Hello. I'm trying to find Edelon. Do you know Edelon? Uh, this is Edelon's village. Ah, success. Thanks a bunch. I appreciate it. Enjoy the water. The man with Edelon is Justin Talon. Justin has devoted his life to tracking down World War II aircraft wrecks in the Pacific. Hi. Justin? Edelon? Justin Talon. Nice to meet you. Two years before, Edelon led Justin to a wreck site two hours from the village. Can you give me some details? Justin took some pictures of numbers on the plane to confirm its identity. Yeah, well, that's the tail. So this is taken from the actual wreckage, huh? That's correct. You can see here, it's a uh, light blue colored paint of a US Navy aircraft from World War II, the stenciled Navy, and below that, the airplane's bureau number, in this case, 5192. Have you traced the uh, tail number back to find out the history of it? Yes, without a doubt, this bureau number makes it an airplane flown by a pilot named James Sutherland. To locate the wreck site, Ralph, Edlon, and Justin must go on an arduous trek through the same jungle terrain that Pug Sutherland endured when he parachuted out of his plane. All right, one of the interesting things about this epic encounter is it didn't just end at the completion of the dogfight. In fact, for Sutherland, his troubles were just beginning. A one-hour climb brings them to the top of the ridge that overlooks the valley into which Pug's plane crashed. Yeah, you can almost picture him leaping over the side, and free falling a distance, and then poof, the parachute opens, and next thing you know, he's in the trees. He begins by doing the right thing. He knows he's got to get away from the parachute landing area because that's where any search effort is going to begin. They will focus on that and try to track him down. But he's operating on adrenaline at that point. So all of his wounds, uh, he's either ignoring them or not feeling them. Then he gets in cover and he takes an assessment of how bad off he is, and he's in pretty bad shape, especially the bullet that's gone through his foot. He spots some Japanese in a tower that are actually searching for Americans, but he sees them first and decides to avoid the high ground and the easy movement areas and get back into the dense jungle. Pug is now in a dangerous situation as he crosses enemy-held territory. He lost his handgun when he bailed out, so he has no way of defending himself if he stumbles into a sentry. Once he descends into the jungle, his problems compound somewhat. First of all, I mean, I'm just st standing here and the sweat is pouring off me. He's trying to move away from the danger area, so he's, he's profusely sweating. He's got adrenaline coursing through him. He's got to deal with snakes and insects and uh, vines that have thorns on him like barbed wire and the disorientation that occurs with a 200-foot canopy above him where he can't tell east from west because he can't, has no idea where the sun is. So all of these things are hitting him, bang, 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 one after another, but he's making the right decisions. He's going the way that's gonna keep him from being observed, and he's keeping his wits about him. For Ralph, the scramble from the ridge to the bottom of the ravine is exhausting. He is relieved when Edelon eventually guides him to a section of the stream that runs along the valley bottom. 
This is where the remains of the wildcat are scattered. Finally, Ralph reaches the first piece of wreckage. Pratt and Whitney, for sure. First thing I notice is the condition of the prop here. Uh, you can see there's been battle damage, and there's clear evidence of the damage. Uh, two penetrations right here. The top one uh, looks to be about 7.7 .7 millimeter. Uh, the holes are from the rear forward. You can see the extrusion coming out on the forward side here. So this, this engine's seen action. In Sakai's account of the dogfight, he claims to have aimed at the Wildcat's engine. So Ralph wants to check it for signs of damage. You can see this uh, cylinder has, has fallen away and the other two are missing. Uh, if they had been blown off, you would see some deformation of the, uh, the, the cylinder well here and I can't see and I don't feel any shiver, slivers of metal coming through there, but again, they may have rusted off. As I come around to the back bank of, of uh, the cylinders, this one, for sure, we can determine there's been a problem. Ralph is looking at what remains of the circular bank of cylinders from the Wildcat's radial engine. He discovers that one at the back has been hit by what he believes was probably a large caliber shell. That gives a lot of credibility to what Sakai claims when he says he, he fired at the engine. And we, we have clear evidence that something very powerful has hit this rear cylinder and knocked it all to hell and gone. But everything I've seen here is consistent with the Pug Sutherland story and the Sidora Sakai story. And uh, so that's, uh, that's impressive. There's a piece of history right here in front of us. But the big mystery of why Pug didn't fire his guns when he had Sakai in his sights can't be solved by looking at a rusty engine. To answer this question, Ralph will need to track down the Wildcat's machine guns. These are located in the wing that was last seen further up the ravine. Unfortunately, a large mudslide has recently come through this gully. It is obvious that much of the remaining wreckage has been swept away or buried. Eventually, the team finds a small piece of wing. Oh, Justin, I was hoping we'd find a whole lot more of the wing up here. Uh, I mean, we've got a little bit here, the wingtip, uh, it's pretty evident. It's got the navigation light here. You can see the bulb and part of the filament still exposed there. Uh, my, during my first visit, Edelon and I, we found the U.S. star, the wing, and you can see from all this severe erosion that uh, Mother Nature has carried those items further down. I was hoping to find... The... But as Ralph and Justin discuss abandoning the search, Edelon, the man who first found the wreckage, has spotted a crucial new piece of evidence. Oh my God. He has found a 50 caliber round from the Wildcat's wing mounted machine gun. Okay, this is a 50, and lo and behold, it shows battle damage. I mean, this, this round has been hit with something, and so that, that explains what happened to at least one of his guns. We know Pug had at least one live bullet left. So it's really significant find, and uh, it makes this whole trip well worthwhile. One little bitty round that we found. Ralph is keen to search for more wreckage, but Cyclone Jim is forecast to hit the island that day. And Edelon warns that there is only an hour of light left to complete the steep ascent ahead of them. Oh, I'm whipped. I mean, we've come down that ridge into the ravine and then clawed our way up to the top here. Well, none of us have any bullet holes in us. None of us are bleeding. None of us are in shock from having bailed out of an airplane that's just been shot to pieces. And, and the only thing that, that I can think about right now is what an amazing feat Pug Sutherland accomplished getting out of this stuff. This is awesome. After several hours, Pug finally makes it through the jungle and reaches the coast. Exhausted from his trek, he collapses under a log. He is completely dehydrated from the experience. When he wakes up, he is desperate for a drink. Some teenage boys from a nearby village spot Pug and offer to look after him. 
One of them, Bruno Nana, still lives in the same village. Ralph is keen to meet him. This man is named Ralph. Oh, good morning. Good to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Living history. Bruno, do you remember that morning, August 7th, 1942, here on Guadalcanal? Yes. And what did you see? American uh, need a plane, big plane, with small plane fighter, and big ship, boom, boom, and war, all day, all night. Despite the risk of Japanese reprisals, Bruno was determined to help the wounded airmen. Well, he was quite friendly, and he was in a lot of pain from his bullet wounds. He needed help, and he wanted me to take him to Lunga Point. There wasn't enough time to organize the trip, so we took him to our village and fed him. I cleaned his wounds and stayed with him through the night. At about four o'clock, I woke him and took him to the beach. When we arrived, my friend had got a canoe ready. After paddling for some time, he saw some soldiers on the beach. We hoped they were American, as he told us to paddle to the shore. The Marines asked us, how can we thank you for rescuing our friend? We said we don't want anything, but they insisted on giving us food and cigarettes. Unknown to Bruno and his friend, Japanese soldiers witnessed the whole exchange. As we paddled back to our village, more soldiers waved at us. But this time they were Japanese. They forced us to come ashore, then they destroyed our canoe. As a punishment, they are tied to a tree for four days, without food and water. We were really thirsty, but instead of water, one of the soldiers gave us urine to drink. Before dawn, on the fourth night, my friend worked his ropes loose. He freed me, and we escaped back to our village. Around Bruno's village today, there are still plenty of reminders of the battle for Guadalcanal. Among many pieces of wreckage is an intact wing of a wildcat. Ralph is curious to check out the mechanism that fed 50 caliber bullets to the machine gun. Ever since Edelon found that round at the crash site, I've uh, been trying to piece together the possibilities that uh, Sutherland encountered in terms of how his guns were functioning during the rest of that dogfight. Now here we have a wing of a wildcat, and here's where the 50 caliber machine gun would be mounted. Right underneath where my hand is would be the ammunition drum that would feed 50 caliber ammunition, as I'm showing you here, through a very narrow chute. It's over a roller and through this area. And the tolerances, as you can see, are fairly tight. It's hard for me to get these rounds to move smoothly. What this tells me is that this system had very tight tolerances. Any abuse is going to give you problems with jamming. And Sutherland had plenty of abuse. In his journal, Pug describes battle damage received during his first attack. My fuselage aft had been hit, probably by the bomber's tail gunner. My windshield had shattered from a glancing shot. Edelon has been back to Pug's crash site to look for more evidence. His eagle eyes have spotted another important find. Oh my. Huh. There's no doubt what that is, right? That's a 45 automatic, uh, you know, pistol. And that's the type of weapon that uh, Sutherland had, and it's the type of weapon that, and, and holster mechanism that got uh, hung up as he was trying to bail out over the side of the aircraft. That's right. So uh, this is an amazing find. It's hard to prove conclusively that this is Pug's gun. But the fact that it was found right at the crash site is enough to convince Ralph. I'm holding the weapon that, that uh, Pug Sutherland had in 1942 on 7th of August, the opening day of the air battles over Guadalcanal. This is just an incredible piece of history here. Amazing. Amazing. All right, what else have you got? 
Edelon has recovered more ammunition from the Wildcats' guns. And again, uh, you can see it hasn't been fired. The uh, primer's uh, still intact. It hasn't been hit by the firing pin. And now we've got uh, two more rounds. And that's pretty conclusive evidence that he had significant amounts of ammo still left in that aircraft. He's very happy. On his last night on the island, Ralph carries out a closer examination of the damaged 50 caliber round found at the wreck site. I think we've come to some conclusions that clear up a lot of the mystery. One of which is why didn't Pug shoot down Saburo Sakai when Sakai wound up flushing out in front of him for that brief period just before Sakai finally moved back and, and shot down Sutherland. Ralph is convinced that this 50 caliber round from Pug's plane exploded in the ammunition belt feeding the machine gun. The very end, the neck has flared somewhat. That would not have occurred due to impact damage from the crash. That can only occur if this round is fired outside of a chamber of the 50 caliber machine gun. So what caused this round to detonate prematurely? Pug attacked a Betty bomber, and during that attack, he came under fire from two weapons on that Betty bomber, a 7.7 millimeter round and a 20 millimeter round. We know that some of those rounds hit his aircraft because Pug reported that his windscreen was damaged. That could only be done by the 7.7 millimeter round. A 20 millimeter round would have done a lot more damage than simply crack. If we take a 7.7 round and then place it in position on the 50 caliber round, we will see that it fits nicely into this groove that cracked open the belt. I mean, this, this is an amazing discovery. This, this really is the Rosetta Stone of the Pug Sutherland shootdown. Ralph thinks that when Pug's plane was hit by 7.7 millimeter bullets from the bomber's gunner, one penetrated his wing and caused a round in the machine gun belt to explode, which jammed the gun. Sakai was lucky. His life was probably spared by the damage to the Wildcat's machine gun. Having survived this narrow escape, Sakai could have turned around and headed home with the bombers, but he doesn't want to. This battle is far from over for him. He searches the skies for more Wildcats. Far in the distance, he saw eight dots, and thinking there were fighters, he just pulled away from his wingmen and he just opened full throttle and he went after him. And when he was about, uh, about 300 yards, he realized, uh-oh, you know, these are dive bombers and they have uh, tail gunners pointed at him. So it was too late to turn back. And he opened up with everything he had right through the formation. And that's when he got hit. One of the tail gunners, he actually was so close that uh, he saw Sakai's face. He saw Sakai go back in his seat like that, and it was like a flash on a movie screen, boom, and he was gone. I blinked several times. What was wrong? Everything was so red. A wild panicky thought gripped me, I might be blind. Then I shifted my feet to the rudder bar. Only my right foot moved, and the zero skidded as the bar went down. My whole left side seemed to be paralyzed. Bullet fragments from the Dauntless dive bombers have left Sakai seriously wounded. Sam explains to Ralph how keeping the plane airborne would turn into the most formidable endurance test Sakai had ever faced. When I interviewed Sakai, he showed me uh, his flight goggles and the flight helmet he was wearing at the time of this mission. And the bullet actually entered his head uh, just above his uh, right eye uh, and smashed the uh, rim of his goggles. And it actually exited uh, in the back of his head. You, it's quite apparent if you actually take the helmet in your hand, the leather helmet, mm -hmm. and see where the, uh, the entry and the exit was. So it went through his skull? It went clean through his brain. And it's a miracle that he wasn't instantly killed. The fact that it smashed the windscreen as it came through uh, slowed the, the bullet down just enough uh, that it, it didn't kill him. Instantly, 
the entire left side of his body is paralyzed. He can't move his left arm, he can't move his left leg. To stop himself lapsing into unconsciousness, Sakai gave himself jolts of pain by irritating his wounds. He is so convinced he will die, he decides to end it all in a kamikaze blaze of glory. There was a period of time when he flew back and forth trying to look for enemy ships to crash into. And so he would fly this way and then turn around and he would kind of zigzag a little bit. If I must die, at least I could go out as a samurai. My death would take the enemy with me. A ship. I needed an enemy ship. But then finally he told me that he saw a vision of his mother saying, son, wake up, wake up, you know, get a hold of yourself. Point your zero in this direction. So he said he pointed his zero in this one certain direction and just prayed that he would make it home. I don't think it's, it's, it's easy to appreciate that epic feat of airmanship that, that took place with this guy with no navigation instruments, no radio, yep. other than a compass and a, and a bullet through his head. Uh, it's just an astounding achievement. It's one of the epic flights in aviation history. After an agonizing five-hour flight, Sakai, blind in one eye, paralyzed down one side, and barely conscious, finally brings his plane down at the base in Rabaul. It was one of the epic air battles of all time, and one man comes out a victor. But it doesn't end there. The epic nature of this battle continues for both of them. Later on in life, they both had to look back upon it as the greatest adventure of their life. Even though Saburu Sakai and Pug Sutherland suffered serious injuries on that first day's dogfight over Guadalcanal, they both recovered and went on to fly more combat missions. With only one eye, Sakai made further kills. By the end of the war, he had become the Imperial Japanese Navy's highest scoring ace, credited with destroying 64 Allied planes. Pug also recovered and became an ace. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He returned to the Naval Academy and taught new pilots to fly. Then, in 1949, James Pug Sutherland was killed in an accident while taking off from a carrier. After stepping from his zero for the last time, Sakai vowed never to kill another living creature again, not even a mosquito. After the war, the Allies banned Japanese pilots from flying. He became a practicing Buddhist. Later, he actively sought reconciliation with the Americans he once fought, even meeting Harold Jones, the rear gunner who shot him in the head. His memoirs of these wartime flying adventures were turned into a popular movie in Japan. He died in the year 2000, aged 84. Amazingly, Pug and Sakai survived their first day of dogfighting over Guadalcanal. But August 7th, 1942, was a day of reckoning for both sides. One of Japan's top guns was sidelined from the campaign, and five of the eight Wildcats under Pug's command were lost. However, during the next three months, the fortunes of war favor the Wildcats. 42 Japanese Zeros are destroyed at a cost of 41 US Wildcats. Although Zero pilots held the early advantage, Wildcat pilots soon learned to make the most of their sturdy fighter. The capture of the Guadalcanal airstrip on August 7, 1942, proved to be the turning point in the war against Japan. And Pug Sutherland and Saburo Sakai's exploits on that day remain a soaring example of the courage and skill of the true fighter ace.